found 1 Samuel chapter 17. Why don't you stand with me, please, as we look at this portion of God's Word. The Bible says, And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That would be 78 pounds. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, which would be 15 pounds. And one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose your man, choose a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall be ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Our Heavenly Father, the whole world knows this story. The comparison of a David facing Goliath is one of those sports analogies that has been worn out. But it's a factual story, one that actually happened. And the, the God of Israel is our God today, who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins. The battles have been fought since the times of Israel when they were a nation back in that day and they are a nation again today because of your will. And the battles are being fought in the church of Jesus Christ. We believe in you. We want to stand for you. And it seems like at times the odds are against us. But we have a God in heaven. We believe in you. So I pray that this message today would be an encouragement to those that find themselves in a struggle. Bless them, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 2 Peter 2, 1, no, 2 Peter 1, 12 says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent, but to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. The principles I share with you this morning will be facts that you know, or perhaps facts that you knew of in the past and you've forgotten. Or perhaps they're facts that you've never heard of at all, but will make sense to you, I hope. I sat in my office this week, and I wrote down some words that start with D. Doubt, darkness, despair, despondency, desperation. All D words. If you got a D in school, that meant you were almost failing. So obviously, these words, if they're in your life, at times it seems like you're almost failing, but you've not failed yet because you're still here. You're hoping for a, against hope that it seems like you're looking for a light at the end of the tunnel. There are other problems that we'll talk about later in the message, but there are always trials in life and... Let's talk about the text, the story from our text this morning. As you can see, the Philistines and the Israelites were squared off against each other. Not a lot of fighting going on, just a lot of hollering. A lot of times hollering leads up to a fight. Sometimes hollering is just hollering. I grew up in a home where there was some hollering going on at times. Generally, mom hollering at us. Because we didn't seem to hear the first time. Did that happen in your home? I I don't know how many times I've said to my kids, how many times do I have to say something? It should only be once. How many times? I ask them, how many times? And they say, once. All right. And I've said that a hundred times. And they always give the right answer, but the wrong obedience. So I tend to give them a little motivation every now and then, just tell them a little child-raising advice. So obviously those things are struggles. There's always battles. A lot of times hollering is not a good thing. A lot of times if there's a lot of hollering in your house, that's not a good sign. Well, obviously in our battle this morning with David and Goliath, there was a giant. His name was Goliath. He stood up there and he defied the armies of Israel. He called him, send me a man. I want a man. 
We can fight man to man. If he beats me, we'll serve you guys. But if I beat him, you'll serve us. I think Goliath thought his chances were pretty good. And so did the Israelites. There was a lot of angst going on. Meanwhile, back at the farm, don't ever forget that whatever's going on in your life is not the only thing going on in the affairs of God. God's got more than one thing going on. We've got this situation. We've got a situation here where Goliath is confronting the armies of Israel, and it's not going well. And then we have another situation where there's just just shepherd boy on the side of a hill watching a bunch of sheep. I got one word for that, boring. There he is. Somebody's got to do it. There, he's watching the sheep. On occasion, though, danger pops up. A lion and a bear come out. David is able to vanquish the enemy, kills him. Kills the lion, kills the bear. I don't know if he skins him and hangs up the car. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say any of that stuff. But he, obviously, he, he overcomes the enemy, if you will. And so all of this time, sometimes your life may seem somewhat boring. But the fact is, there are events taking place that whether you realize it or not, are training for future events in your life. Sometimes that boring job may be just the training that you need. Or sometimes the, the, uh, the battle will be just the training that you need. But those things are going on. So David is in one place. The Philistine army is in another. And while Israel is afraid. David dreams of the day when he gets to fight. He gets the word one day. Father calls up on his cell phone. Asks how he's doing. Hey, I want you to take some food to the boys. See, militaries now, if you serve in the United States military, they clothe you, they feed you, they take care of all those things. Back in Bible times, militaries fended for themselves. Sometimes families would bring food. Sometimes they would get their food from the enemies that they vanquished. Sometimes, obviously, it was provided to them, but it came in various forms. And on this day, his, David's dad said, why don't you go and take some food to the boys? And the Bible says that it's some cracked corn and some bread and some cheese. So I'm thinking cracked corn is Fritos, bread is yeast rolls. And cheese is cheese it. So he gets some Fritos and cheese it's and yeast rolls, and he gets it all together. And he's excited to go to the battle. I'm gonna get. I it, my exciter is broke. I haven't been excited for a long time for too many things. But sometimes, once in a while, you'll have an event where you just can't wait to get there. And it's one of those events where David can't wait to get there. And he's thinking, man, I'm going to see God's army. And they're going to be showing them what for. God's got an army marching through this land. And he's got this whole thing going on in his mind. And he can't wait to see the soldiers. And we're just going to kick some Philistine butt, I'm telling you. He's excited to go. But when he gets there, it's nothing like he imagined. So when he gets there, he, he finds his brother Eliab and, hey, buddy, how you doing? Great to see you. How's, how's the battle going? And about that time, July, Goliath steps forth again. Israelites, King Saul, you men over there. Hey, where's the man to fight me? Where are you, man? Send me a man. You about your losers? What kind of God do you serve? But you can't even find one man willing And you know, fear is a cancer that spreads. Doubt, angst. And obviously, we weren't there, but someone said years ago everything rises and falls on leadership. I believe that. That's not to put me in any particular place, but we are inspired by leaders or we are dismayed by leaders, depending on who the leader is. And on that day, King Saul was afraid, and it spread into his army. And really, the soldier that should have gone and fought Goliath would have been King Saul himself. 
He was the commander in chief. Or maybe one of his best men. He would have known who they were, who his right hand guy was. I can tell you in this church, if we have to go to battle, which that's not in the pl- don't 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 misread anything I'm saying. But if there ever was a time, I can pick half a dozen guys right now. I can tell you these are the guys I'd want with me, and I'd stand behind them as they go forward. <laughs> you know, but you know who your good guys are. So did King Saul. And he was coming up with a big fat zero. He was afraid. And so, bless you. And so, there they were. David shows up and he sees the fear and he hears the enemy hollering and nobody dares to do anything. And and David is just uh, speechless. And so, who is this guy? Who dares to talk like this to the army of the living God? And he starts mouthing off. Well, you know what? That's not really appreciated. And he starts spouting off, and he gets to the king, and you know the story. And David gets to the king, and he says, look, I killed a lion and a bear. And this guy, that lion and bear, this giant's nothing different to them. God's going to help me defeat this guy. Let me at him. King Saul says, okay, here's my arm. Here's my sword. He puts it all on. He can't move. He says, this won't work. I've never tried this stuff before. He takes it all off. He grabs a staff. He grabs five smooth stones from the brook, and he walks towards Goliath. And as he does, Goliath sees him coming, and I don't, Goliath is over nine feet tall, nine feet nine, okay? I've tried to picture in my mind how this would look. I'm six feet. Um, This is probably, what, 18 inches? I don't know. He's taller than this. I'm I'm, I'm, from the things I've read, David was five foot something. So we've got Goliath standing up here, and we've got David being down here about like this. Size is, is an intimidating thing. We've got men in this church that are like 6'8". They're friendly, but they're intimidating, you know? <laughs> they're just, you, you, I'm, I'm always thinking, I don't think I could take this guy. Maybe I could get him at the knees. I don't know, but it's just, those are things that you think about. And there's David, I can take this guy. Are you out of your mind? But he was willing. And he went forward, believing. And he grabbed the stones and he, he threw the shot after Goliath had mocked him and said, what am I, a dog? And that's what they did. If there was dogs, you took a stick out and you chased the dogs away. David had a stick. And Goliath thought he was a dog. And he thought this is going to be fun. And I love what David says. This is the best part of the whole story. If you look in, in your text in 1 Samuel 17 and you go over in, I've got it in verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of the hosts of God, the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, unto the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds. Who talks like that? I was in a few scrapes in the schoolyard growing up at school. You know, and it's always, when boys are young, it's always trying to establish who's the toughest or whatever. I'll tell you what, you, back then, you didn't mess with farmers. There was a lot of city kids that they sat home and read comic books. Those kids really didn't belong in a fight with a farmer. It just was not fair. The, the farmers were workers, they were wood splitters, they were hay throwers, they were work, they, they, they did things. And a comic book was something they didn't even own. And then there was the other kids, they were intelligent, they were smart, they got all A's, we didn't like them. But they were, they didn't have, they hadn't done a lot of physical work. Those, those were not fair fights. It was, and so and in, in, you're in a few scrapes, and it's kind of fun, and, and kids get up, and there's friends and all that. It's like the old Western shows that you watch. They beat each other up, and then they slap each other on the back, and then they say, you know, let's go right off into the sunset. So those are the kinds of things that you grow up with. Nowadays, in a fight at school, they pull a knife. What happened? Anyway, 
So, but never, ever, in one of those childhood scrapes, did it ever occur to me to look at someone, I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds. You would never, that would even cross your mind. Who is this? Who says this stuff? The boldness of David was incredible. Don't miss that. So obviously he kills him. He jumps up there. He had no sword. He takes Goliath's own sword. He slices off his head. He holds it up. This is a guy that is not battle hardened. He'd never killed a human being before. He took to it naturally. That's kind of scary, but he did. And he grabbed that head and he picked it up in the air. And the blood's dripping from it. And he holds it all up and he says, Goliath is dead. Can you imagine? <laughs> huh? Yeah, he goes and hurls his guts out afterwards. But there goes the Fritos. But anyway, it's unbelievable. But can you imagine the joy in the nation of Israel when that boy stood up there and said, Goliath is dead? How great will it be someday when death will have been conquered? Satan will have been thrown into the lake of fire and all the battles that we fight will be over. So I got three points from Adrian Rogers that I want to share with you very quickly. Number one, the vicious enemy. Number two, the vicarious encounter. And number three, the victorious example. The vicious enemy. You and I are in battles. I am in a battle. Say that with me. I am in a battle. If you're not in one right now, honestly, I'm afraid that you're not engaged if you don't see the battles that are going on in our country right now. Let me say some words to you and see if you acknowledge to yourself whether you've heard them lately. Cancer, COVID, divorce, disease, fake news, riots, loneliness, isolation, family disputes, communism, socialism, banning of social media platforms, suppression of free speech, and the list could go on and on and on. Folks, those are battles that are going on right now with some of you. There's never a time in this church that there isn't a serious struggle going on that God needs to be sincerely talked to and asked for deliverance, for interceding on someone's behalf. Sometimes there are questions where we go before the Lord and we don't know how to pray. We just say, Lord, I don't know about this. Will you please help? And obviously he does. The vicious enemy. There seems to be no end to the battles that are raging in our country like we've never seen before. For instance, I mentioned this to my wife this morning. You know, there's 2,500 troops in Afghanistan and there's 25,000 troops in Washington, D.C. right now. What's that saying about our country? Where are we at? America was founded as a moral nation driven by biblical truths. Founded on the belief in God. We were a Christian nation. I say were because sad to say that is no longer guiding us. In four years of hate and evil and lies and all of the manure that's been dumped out in Washington has not made for a better society. The battle rages. And I don't know what will become of the United States of America. But you want to be praying for your nation. Not only that, there are battles going on in individual lives. We live in a fallen, sinful world. There will never be a time when you will not find reason to be afraid. David confronted the enemy because he recognized the cause that needed to be confronted. Remember David said, is there not a cause here? Sometimes you and I just need to recognize there's times where God's people need to take a stand and it is not popular. It was not popular for David in the nation of Israel on that day. He was all alone. He was looked at as a wacko, someone that didn't belong. His own brother said, go home, David. You don't belong here. The giant was mocking the God of Israel. Question, what is it that makes you mad? The Bible says, be angry and sin not. And I found lately in the last year or so, that I didn't like to get mad, and I don't like to get mad, but there are things to get mad at in society. 
That doesn't mean that we're going to go and storm the Capitol like a bunch of idiots did. That was evil on January 6th. I don't know whether it was leftist or rightist or whatever, but it was all evil. Now, you can state your opinion and stand for something without breaking the law and destroying property. And obviously, there's a lot that can be said about those things, but that's not the purpose of my message this morning. There are giants out there that will always want to destroy three things, and that is faith, freedom, and family. When the cause is just, the cost is never too high. Don't miss that. When the cause is just, the cost is never too high. Someone said, I'd rather fail fighting for something that will ultimately succeed. Listen to this. Someone said, I'd rather fail fighting for something that will ultimately succeed than succeed in something that will ultimately fail. The vicious enemy. Not only is there a vicious enemy, there's a vicarious encounter. Now, vicarious is a Christian word. It means to experience something through someone else's life. We talked of the vicarious suffering of Christ. He suffered in our place. You cheer as David walks up to the giant with a sling in the hand. You cheer as someone wins against evil. You cheer when someone has the courage to confront wrong. That's the vicarious encounter. It seems that a winner has many friends, but the loser loses alone. We are so afraid that we'll be alone. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. Whatever battle you are fighting, your friends are with you when you win, and your friends are with you when you lose. If people abandon you when you lose, they were never your friends. We don't want to be isolated. We don't want to be alone. I'm reminded this morning as we sat in church that we need each other. I get depressed through the week. You ought to turn off the news, turn off Facebook, turn off all of those things. And I've found that some of you have tried to turn off Facebook and you can't keep it off. I wonder whether you own it or if it owns you. I'm just asking. And I know how hard it is sometimes. Don't ask me to give up coffee. I'm just sharing here, okay? I know what it's like to have something that controls me, and caffeine would be one of those things. I love coffee. If you want to honor your pastor in any way, bring me coffee. Anyway, I digress. There are some things that are, are, are just don't add to the quality of your life in the long run, and, and there can be evil in it if it's not controlled. Paul talked about our inability to stand, Listen to this, and, and we're coming to the end here. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency and the power may be of God, not of us. Paul is saying, we're well, really, we have this treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in soldiers, tough and strong, able to take on anything. Come on, I'll take you, I'll fight you. Paul says, we're just clay pots. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency, listen to this, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, when somebody takes a gun to a knife fight, you're not surprised when the guy with the gun wins. It was obvious. The fix was in. And if God chose powerful, strong, wealthy people to fight his battles, for instance, there comes a time in the back of the book where Israel stands alone, and people wonder, where is America in end times? Well, if America fought Israel's battles for her, everybody would say it was America that saved the day. And it'll never be America that saves the day. It will be God that saves the day, okay? So we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency may be seen that it's of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The vicarious encounter. Let me tell you something. If you're fighting the battle, you're not alone. 
There are people cheering for you, praying for you, wanting you to succeed. Don't you think for a second, Satan is so good at isolating us, making us think we're the only one that thinks a certain thing. We're all alone. You're never alone when God is on your side. Fact is, you're never alone when you're on God's side. Just make sure you're on God's side. And lastly, we have the victorious example. Man, oh man, how great was it when David said, Goliath is dead. How great was it when Christ came out of that tomb three days later? How great was it when every now and then we see prayer answered and then that does happen? When we beg God for something and someone is healed or, or someone is redeemed or someone is saved. How many times have we prayed for a loved one and they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? That is the greatest victory that has ever taken place. And every now and then we get word that so-and-so, I witnessed a so-and-so and and I shared my faith and I thought they'd reject it. But a week later they called and said they trusted Christ as their Savior. I'm telling you, that's big. That's big. We all rejoice in those victories. If you don't get excited about someone coming to Jesus Christ, that they were dying and going to hell, but God rescued them and saved them and redeemed them, and now they're headed to heaven, folks, that's big. Say that with me. That's big. Oh, I love that stuff. The victorious example. Satan's the enemy. We're soldiers chosen in a battle. Are we part of the fearful many or are we part of the faithful few? I ask that again. In Israel, there was a fearful many or are we part of the faithful few? And of course, Christ is our victorious example. Interesting that Teresa Burial showed a video of Ruth Graham Bell uh, this morning and I have... Something else from her. Listen to this. She shared a convicting story about a Christian who had just arrived in a free country in, for, from years of persecution. Of course, here in the United States. He was appalled at the seeming casual commitment to Jesus and materialistic contamination of these Christians. And he said, and he said so. So he came to our country looked around at the apathy of Christians in the United States and hated the materialism that he saw. Sometime later, he returned to visit the friend to whom he had spoken so bluntly when he first arrived. He asked if his friend remembered what he had said and the bitterness of his criticism, and the friend remembered. And the man stood silent for a few moments reflecting, and the friend tensed for a second attack said, I've come to apologize, both for what I said and the way in which I said it. He said simply, I was merely afraid. I did not know how dangerous freedom could be. It's been a year now, and I am worse than those I criticized. Then he added a significant statement. It is more difficult to live the Christian life under freedom than under repression. Iranian Christian leader Luke Yagnazar lives in the United States. He concludes, It is more difficult to be a Christian in the USA than in Iran. There you are either a Christian or you are not. Pastor Samuel Lamb in southern China says, We have physical persecution, but you have materialism. Your lot is harder because we know what we are spiritually fighting. Many times you do not. Another Chinese church leader adds, once you are chasing after money, there's no time and energy for church affairs. And the government knows that materialism will destroy the church faster than persecution can. I tell my co-workers in China that the biggest enemy we're facing is no longer communism, it's materialism. Christian, in the United States of America, we have come to expect that what we've always had is what we will always get. And I don't see where our Bible promises that. But it, what it does require us, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Are you part of the fearful many, or are you part of the faithful few? Heavenly Father, thank you for our time here this morning. 
Lord, the greatest battle that was ever fought was on the cross of Jesus Christ, where you willingly gave yourself and was nailed to that cross and died in my place to pay for my sin debt. And Lord, one thing we always do on a Sunday morning is we offer that wonderful gift to anyone that will accept it. It's as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Forgive my sins. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there's an invitation that you need to give to God Almighty. That invitation is to enter your heart and life, to come in. The Bible says it. In Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. And the responsibility of us is to open our heart's door to the things of God. And you do that. The Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. So you do what you say you believe. And if you believe that Christ died and rose again and took your place, then you need to invite him into your heart as your personal savior. This is the greatest offer you will ever hear ever in your life if you've not trusted Christ before. And so we pray a prayer together. Everyone prays it quietly. And if you've never prayed it, we're just praying it to help you say these words. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Forgive my sins. I believe in you. Help me to trust you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. So Cornerstone, let's pray that prayer together. And if you never have before, then please say these words and mix them with faith and mean it. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. I believe in you. Help me to trust you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here this morning on the main floor, not the balcony, but on the main floor, and say, Stan, I trust you, Christ is my Savior. I invite him into my heart. I hadn't done that before, but I did just now. Will you raise your hand on the main floor so I can see it? I'll point to you and you can put it down. I won't embarrass you, point you out or anything, but I'd like to know. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Somebody else. I prayed that prayer and I meant it. About up in the balcony. Stan, I prayed that prayer to receive Christ as my Savior. I believe in him. And I had never done that before. Looking in the balcony. All over the building, if you prayed that prayer and I did not see your hand, hold it right up. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for that person who raised their hand. God, if there are people here this morning that are going away and never having prayed that prayer, they are lost. You don't get to heaven by working or trying or being good. You get to heaven by recognizing that God came down and we can't get to you. You came to us. You gave your life. We need to trust you and invite you into our heart and life. And then you said you'd never leave us or forsake us. Lord, there are battles being fought. I pray for that person that Satan is holding back. I pray that they'd not have peace until they meet the Prince of Peace. Lord, I pray for Christians this morning that they're fearful. Fear is a natural thing. We're all afraid at times. But faith is not necessarily the absence of fear. It's the presence of God in the battle. And Lord, I pray for that person that's going through an incredible time in their life, financially, their marriage, their kids their home, with their job, with their health, any number of things. Lord, I pray that you would comfort them, that they'd sense your presence, and you'd give them the will to press forward. Thank you for great examples in the Word of God that show us that even the biggest giants can be beaten. Bless the invitation, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.